1972 in the Delta, we were the only guns left. Every the army was pulling out. We were the only Cobra helicopters in Fort Corps right? from Saigon, basically down to the tip of Vietnam, was the Mekong Delta. So we had a lot of special ops missions. We we kind of caught everything. Anybody that needed an army helicopter gunship, we kind of got involved in. And uh, so, the, the, as the army was pulling out, the the, the the Viet Cong were always there. They they never went away. And it was it got to the point at the end there where we go out and recon by fire. We'd shoot into a tree line, and. A month later, we go back, and that same tree line were drawing fire out of. They didn't even move. I mean, they, they weren't even trying to hide. They were taking their country back. You know, so we were pulling out. And what we used to do is take a single ship Cobra at night, and we do security. You know, one end of our airstrip we gave to the Vietnamese for security. And when I had an officer of the guard, you could walk through there and you could smell marijuana. I mean, these guys were high. I, mean, I was afraid to walk by their bunkers. You know, I had to say American, American. Because you know I didn't want to get shot, but uh, everything was kind of falling apart at that point. You know, and uh, the Viet Cong were, were all coming back in force. So I was flying a single ship Cobra at in, at night in the evening, late evening, early early night, right when it started to get dark. And I'm flying off to the end of our runway with a, on the Vietnamese side, on the, uh, it would have been probably the, the western side of our runway, and. I'm doing a recon, single ship recon, and being a Cobra, of course, if we had a target, we could engage it, you know, we had the armament to do it. And we just took small arms fire. It doesn't take a whole lot to bring a helicopter down, so I, uh, they hit some hydraulic lines, and I went down, and uh, my daughter and I, and, and but they got us pretty quick, but in the process of going down, I had a hard landing. I, I landed real hard, and uh, I crushed some vertebrae in my back. I've got a profile from Vietnam. I I get a 40% disability on my back, and, and that's where I got my purple heart. It was not the fact that I was shot, but I was wounded as a result of hostile fire. The helicopter went down, and I was wounded as part of the helicopter going down. So it's the same thing. That's where I qualified for my purple heart. That I, got. I had 2,000 hours uh, combat time in the COVID in Vietnam. Oh, that's a lot of hours when you consider that your average fuel load in a, in a Cobra helicopter was two hours and 45 minutes. So to get two hour, 2,000 hours combat time, that's, and every time we went out, we were engaged with the enemy. I mean, it wasn't a life-threatening thing every day, but we fired at them, they fired at us. You know, some people say that being in combat is the closest time you'll have to, to really living. You know, the adrenaline's flowing. It's, it's really, uh, uh, you know, everything becomes magnified. It becomes very important to you. And, uh, you know, when you're scared, you're real scared. When you're happy, you're real happy. You know, it's just uh, the, the adrenaline's flowing, and it's uh, uh, really some people get, get into combat junkies. These guys, a lot of the guys that I hear again, my wife says, don't start talking about other people, you know. But I know people that have been in special forces, and they just, you know, they thrive on that excitement. It's like a rodeo rider, you know, that adrenaline rush. And uh, they just can't, they, they don't lose it. They get that adrenaline rush, and it's hard to lose. But uh, when you're scared, you're scared, and when you're happy, you're happy. You know, I remember one time we went out, and I was a gunner, so I'm sitting in the front of the Cobra, and my, I had a 40 millimeter and a, and a minigun firing 7.62s, and I, I could sit up here with kind of like a joystick on one of these computer games, and I could move the turret every time, you know, with this, and I could look at this reticle, and I could find my targets looking down on the ground. Well, as soon as a Cobra rolls in, if it's a single ship, the gunner's responsibility is to keep their heads down the same way that the wingman covers the lead aircraft when they break. That's your vulnerable time. So when you break, you know, you're covering or when you're coming in, you're firing, keeping the fire off of you. Well, we had some, some bad maintenance for a while and I went out and the, the minigun, I fired it, you know, and I, I don't know, maybe I got a, a 200 round burst and it locked up. It just froze and got a jam round in there and it wouldn't turn. So. I had a dead minigun, so I had 40 millimeter, which is a grenade chunker. It goes chop, 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 and it shoots these 40 millimeter grenades. And I didn't get probably 10 of those out, and it locked up. So I had a dead turret. I mean, I could do absolutely nothing. I was just strictly a rider and observer. Well, what happened was the the pilot, he's, he's firing these rockets. He's got 76 rockets in each pod, and he's got four pods. They're, they're 2.75 aerial rockets high explosive called an HE. So he's rolling in. Each one of his runs, he's coming in right in enemy position. And at night, you know, they're firing tracers. Every, about every seventh round is a tracer. You're seeing these tracers at night every seven rounds. And 
when you're making a gun run, you're coming in, diving into the target, and I'm sitting up here in the front of the aircraft, scared to death because I, I'm facing them with nothing. I'm not keeping their head down at all. You know, I'm just coming in there. So I had what was known as this chicken plate. We had a, a, a it used to be kind of like the, the bomber pilots in the gunners war in World War II. It's a heavy chicken plate. And so all I could do is when he started making these gun runs into these enemy positions, we're drawing all this fire. And I'm just sitting up there like, hey, here I am. I was scared to death. I was trying to get every part of my body behind that chicken plate, you know, to squeeze out. I'm not sure. It's like a catcher's. It's about the size of a, of a padded chest thing for a catcher. And I'm trying to put my whole body behind this because I have no function in that aircraft. I, I'm just sitting here trying to stay alive because they're, as we're coming in, I'm not keeping their heads down, and they're firing a whole bunch of, uh, you know, those medium and small arms at us. And... Uh, of course, you only got 36 inches wide as Cobra, so you don't have a whole lot of target, but you feel like you're out here on display. So that was that was one of the scaredest I've ever been. And we made, I think, three runs before he got all his rockets out. And each time we're coming in there right on top of the enemy positions, and I could do nothing but hide behind that chicken plate. You know, I had no function. I couldn't go anywhere. I'm just up here as a target. So I think that's probably the scaredest I've ever been. I have at one point prayed to everybody. I've said, I'm praying to the supreme being. I don't know if it's God. I don't know if it's Buddha. Keep me alive. Help me out. And I think I've prayed to every one of the religion's supreme beings, you know, not to try to be unfaithful to my own Christianity, but I just <laughs> said, I'm not taking any chances. Combat's not a normal situation. It's, it's insanity. It's organized insanity. The, most of the infantry guys, and I felt for them because See, I'd go out and fight my war, and then at night I'd come in and take a clean shower and go to the officer's club and get drunk and go out the next day. Those infantry guys, they were living with the enemy day in and day out. And, and that part of the army, and it's, it's just it's a historical fact. It's not, it's not anything I'm telling you that you don't know. But we had a big drug problem. You know, the 70s the, the, uh, was, was a, before they came in with the volunteer army and they started straightening things out. We had a, a heck of a problem with people getting lost in drugs. I mean, it was bad. And, uh, if, but if you went out there on that line with, with the infantry, not, not everybody, I'm not going to stereotype, but there was a lot of places that I would fly into to resupply, you know, drop off what we call LERP rations, which are dry. Some of these places were so hot, you know, they, they didn't have hot meals and anything else. They had these dry, dehydrated rations, you know, and you you drop off the water and the LERP rations and then they'd mix it together, you know, and, come up with some stew or something, but uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, these guys were high. They stayed high the whole time. Now, they didn't stay, you know, they, I don't know what the rotation schedule was for the infantry guys, but I mean, but they would stay there whatever they thought the prescribed time was, like a week or whatever, 10 days, or I don't know exactly what it was, but then they would come in and rotate and then, they, you know, they would kind of recuperate, but those guys were so scared, and I don't, you know, you're living on a little old fire base, and you've got maybe 30 guys, and, and you can get overrun at any time, and every noise you hear out there on that perimeter might be, you know, a Viet Cong coming in on you. Or... So those guys stayed stayed high. You know, like I said, the Army had a big drug problem. You know, drugs were readily available and people stayed high. Discipline was not what it should be. You know, thankfully the Army's turned itself around. But in those late 60s, early 70s, you know, actually into the, you know, like the later 70s, like mid-70s, the Army had a real big drug, big drug after Vietnam.